So now I want to get into talking a little bit about the mechanism of heart disease, get some foundation so we can get into what to do to prevent it and even potentially reverse it. So the way I like to describe it, the way I think about it is we talk about our friends, the monkey and the rabbit. So the way I think about it is monkeys and rabbits out in nature, they have no coronary artery disease, no plaque buildup, no atherosclerosis whatsoever in their natural environment where they're eating a diet that was made for their bodies, a plant-based diet. They're staying physically active. They don't smoke cigarettes. At least I've never seen a smoking monkey or a smoking rabbit in the past. And, you know, they have completely clean coronary arteries in their whole system. However, if you bring these poor animals, and I don't obviously advocate animal testing, but researchers have taken these animals into the lab and fed them a diet high in cholesterol, high in saturated fats. And within months, just a few months, they severely clog their arteries and can induce heart attacks and strokes. Showing that if you give these animals a diet that's not natural for them, an animal-based diet, it can cause disease and cause these problems. But these researchers did something really amazing, a simple thing. And that's what I love about lifestyle medicine. It's really a simple concept. They took these animals after the arteries were clogged up, put them back in the nature, just gave them back their carrots and bananas and let them go about their business. And guess what happened? The clogging of the arteries reversed itself. And it kind of shows how the default state of the human body, it's been shown in humans as well, or the monkey body or the rabbit body, the default state is to be healthy. And the absolute key to prevention and reversal of heart disease is not necessarily a pill or a procedure. Remove the thing that's causing the harm to the body and the body will heal itself up on its own. Remove the processed foods, remove the animal products, and you will heal up. And so that's the simple concept of lifestyle medicine is so powerful and it works so well. One of the analogies that I use is I kind of say, hey, if you took your took a knife, cut your hand, and you did absolutely nothing, what's going to happen? Your hand's going to bleed, the cut will bleed, but your body will stop the bleeding. It'll eventually form a scab and form a scar. If you do nothing, it will heal up. However, if you wake up and you cut your hand every single day with a knife in the exact same spot, it can never heal because you continuously injure the same spot. Well, our arteries on the inside are no different than the skin on the outside. We continuously, though, injure our arteries, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, tobacco use, secondhand smoke, all these other toxins that we get, and it never gives the arteries the opportunity to heal up and reverse the disease like it needs to. So just remove the thing that's causing the harm. I have another exam analogy for that later on, and, and then the heart disease can reverse itself. So what we really need to do for the little crash course on nutrition is just simplify it as much as possible for everybody. Now, this audience may know a little bit more about this than others, but when you're explaining nutrition to other people, this is, I think, the best way to simplify it and talk it through. We just say there's three food groups. There's processed foods, there's animal foods, and there's plant foods. So processed foods are anything that has sugar, refined carbohydrates like white flour, white bread, white rice, white pasta, uh, or added fats. So processed foods uh, have white flour, sugar, or added fats and oils to them. Even olive oil is technically processed, right? So the key to knowing if something has a processed ingredient, just look at the ingredient list. If there's added sugar, which is about 50 different ways they can put sugar on the label, added oils, which also, you know, oils and lecithins and stuff, there's a gazillion ways they can put that on the label. Uh, or if there's like no fiber in something, you know, it's a refined type of carbohydrate. You need to avoid those at all costs. Like we said, don't just reduce it. Not in moderation should be eliminated. The second food group is the animal-based foods, red meat, white meat, fish, seafood, dairy products, cheese, anything that comes from an animal, eggs, that's an animal product. And then the third is whole unprocessed plant-based foods. Just think of it as these are the three categories. What we need to do is remove the processed foods, remove, or at least, at least dramatically, dramatically reduce the animal foods and focus on eating whole unprocessed plant-based foods. And really a lot of people, when I tell them this concept, they're like, what's left to eat? They're like, oh, geez, come on. There's only 100,000 something edible plant species out there, 200,000 uh, as fruits, vegetables, beans, lentils, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. And you know, when you think about the way most Americans refrigerator looks, 
it looks like a morgue, all these dead animals sitting in there and secretions and ovulations, which are the eggs. And it's just like, ah, it's not very pleasant. But when you change your diet, look how beautiful it could become with all the fruits and vegetables, the colors, the reason we see in colors is so we get attracted to these very nutritious, helpful food items. It is just so much more beautiful. And it's just a common sense approach to health and wellness. Over 200,000 edible plant species. It's absolutely insane. And I focus on telling people that, you know, focus on the fruits and vegetables. There's over 50 different types of beans and lentils, whole grains, nuts and seeds, herbs and spices, and it's beautiful. There's so much to do. We really need to focus on eating whole foods, unprocessed. So then you may ask, how do you define a whole food? And I tell my patients, no, not that type of a whole food. There was a donut company over by me that used to promote this, eat whole foods, H-O-L-E foods. It's like, no, man, that's like making fun of healthy eating. It's horrible. That's not the type of whole food that we're looking at. We define a whole food as something that doesn't have any harmful component added to it. There's no salt, no sugar, uh, no, you know, some type of ex extract or something that's processed and added to the product. There needs to be no healthful component removed. So they didn't take out the fiber is the biggest thing. Uh, so you don't want the, you want the whole wheat, not refined, you know, carbohydrate, wheat, flour, et cetera. Uh, you want the brown rice is better than, than the white rice. There are lots of examples of that. And uh, really you want it to be as minimally processed. Sure. Like tofu is a little bit processed, not devastating. If you have it every once in a while, same with pasta, whole wheat pasta or lentil pasta, it's processed a little bit, uh, but it's not massively processed. So you could have those things a little bit, just not like on a regular basis in large amounts. So that's how we define a whole food. And I always tell people it's important to distinguish between vegan, which can have a lot of those processed ingredients, a lot of the sugar, the oil, refined carbohydrates versus a uh, whole food plant-based. You can make everything on a whole food plant-based diet that you normally eat on the standard American diet. There's just ways you have to modify things and it takes some work with the cooking. And unfortunately, again, culturally, it's harder to do this because restaurants don't have whole food plant-based, low-fat or oil-free foods for the most part. It's improving, but still a challenge. Uh, but there's ways you can make everything on this. The food is great. That's never a concern. So Going back to heart disease now, after our little crash course, crash course on nutrition, something I need to always emphasize when I'm talking about heart disease and lifestyle medicine is how atherosclerosis starts in childhood. It is so important to realize this, that the sooner you get healthy, the sooner you get your health under control, the better you're going to be decades and decades later. It's never too late. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I've seen 90 year olds change their diet and do well, and, but it's still the earlier you do it, the better. When you're born, your arteries are nice and clean. There's no plaque on the inside there. But as young as the age of three, it is very well seen that a lot of three year olds have significant plaques starting to build up in their coronary arteries. This is maybe a 20 year old, 25 year old, and then eventually it could become advanced disease. And then boom, you can have a heart attack. A heart attack happens when plaque has built up slowly over many decades and then suddenly becomes unstable and a blood clot forms. And within minutes, the artery is 100% clogged. The blood flow is completely restricted and it can cause lots of issues, including sudden cardiac death. This is so important to understand. Prevention is the key. Absolutely. They've even shown, this is crazy, pregnant women with genetic high cholesterol, when their LDLs are 300 or 400s, they can detect cholesterol fatty streak buildup in the unborn fetus in the mother's womb. That's how early this process starts in life. So getting your risk factors controlled and starting young is so important to build a good, healthy heart foundation for the rest of your life. So the other big thing is this whole heart attack, this blood clot that can form here, that could suddenly happen. You never know. You could have a 20 or 30% blockage, feel fine. You don't even know it's there because that's only minimal. That's not going to cause any symptom. And then suddenly you get this clot. It cuts off the blood supply. Boom, down you go. Heart attack. Somewhere around a quarter, one out of four to one out of three people, their first symptom of heart disease is sudden death. They just die. And I have heart disease in my family. I was unhealthy for a long time. My cholesterol was high. I was obese, all these things, blood pressure, everything. I never smoked, thank goodness, but I had a lot of secondhand smoke exposure. My mom smoked our whole life. And uh, I knew that I had to be careful here because I didn't want to be somebody that, you know, had a sudden cardiac arrest or, or a big heart attack like that. 
but it didn't really hit me until recently. And I've talked, I've preached this for years and years and years, how you want to prevent heart disease because you never know when you're going to be the one who just suddenly kills over and dies. And I've done good with things and now my cholesterol's down quite a bit. I exercise, but ever, like everybody, it's a struggle. I have my ups and downs like everybody. There's many barriers. There always seems to be something coming my way to motivate me more and remind me of how important it is and how precious life is and how, how really we need to focus on prevention. So this is what happened to me this past November. I was running the Monterey Bay half marathon in Monterey, California. My first half marathon since the pandemic, and at least the first in-person one, I've done some virtual ones. I was running with my two kids. They're teenagers. It was our first half marathon. This was going to be a great race, right? It's a beautiful place out in Monterey. Great scenic. It was a nice weather. I loved it. And so the race got out fine. And I didn't realize I was going to make two really good friends that day, unexpectedly. The man here on the left is Mr. Michael Heileman. He's a computer software engineer in the Bay Area. And the man on the right there is Gregor Gonzalez, a Supreme Court justice uh, judge in the uh, state of Washington. And we got to know each other very well. We're now good friends. And here is what happened. Greg, mile three falls down right in front of me, just goes down. Uh, I could tell something was not right. He didn't, he didn't like stumble. He just boom, down he went and he hit his head on the pavement. He had a pool of blood behind his head. And oh my gosh, I rushed over to him and quickly saw he had no pulse. He wasn't breathing and started doing chest compressions. Thank goodness. Some people stopped and called 911. We were at an awkward part of the course. It took about six minutes for paramedics to get there hooked up a defibrillator. He was in a fatal rhythm called ventricular fibrillation, universally fatal, unless you shock the heart and get the rhythm back to normal. We applied a shock after doing all that CPR. His rhythm went back to normal. He woke up confused. What the heck am I doing here? And got him in the ambulance and away he went to the hospital. Knowing that he was in good hands and he was safe, I called the ER to give him a heads up as to what was happening, called the on-call interventional cardiologist to let him know. And I was a bit frazzled. And at this point, my kids are way in front of me. They're like, oh, dad's slow. What's going on? They didn't, they didn't know what was happening. I said, well, I might as well keep on going on this race. All right. So I kept going. And what happened? Right after the finish line, I was running behind this guy here, Michael Heileman, the second guy. You could see me in the lower right corner behind. So right after the finish line, here's a series of photos uh, that uh, courtesy of USA Today showing how he crossed the finish line here and he wasn't feeling well. He started getting dizzy. He kind of comes over, he grabs the side rail, and then down he goes, full cardiac arrest. No pulse, hit his head, he was bleeding, and I was right behind him. So there I am right there, started CPR. Within a minute or two, a volunteer brought a defibrillator. We hooked him up, ventricular fibrillation, fatal arrhythmia, shocked his heart really quick, within a minute or two for Michael. And he woke up confused. And he stopped his watch from his race. He's like, oh, I'm done with the race. Let me stop the watch. I need to get up, he says. We're like, no, man, you just died, literally. And we got you back. Two runners in the same race right in front of me, both full cardiac arrest, both successfully defibrillated. We got Michael into the ambulance. He went to the hospital once again. I called the ER. I called the interventional cardiologist. And they're like, you got to be kidding me. What, what's going on there? And both of them ended up having severe coronary disease, clogging in the left anterior descending, otherwise known as the Widowmaker. They both received stents, both made full recoveries. Absolutely crazy. So this got a lot of attention and we've been able to use this as a really great way to promote prevention uh, and learning CPR. But I have some comments about that in just a moment. We were featured on the Today Show where they had Michael and Greg meet each other for the first time. And then they uh, reunited me with them uh, for the first time as well. It was very emotional. It was wonderful. We talked things through. Uh, and I love to tell people now that both Greg and Michael are on plant-based diets and they're doing excellent. They plan on running the half marathon again with me this coming November. And of course, we're going to go very slow and they're cleared by their cardiologist already, and uh, we'll have defibrillators nearby, but they should be fine and safe. There should be no concern whatsoever with it, uh, but I'm so proud of them for changing their diet and their lifestyle around. It was quite an amazing thing, and now we're using this opportunity as a way to really spread a positive message. Now, of course, 
the way our culture is and the way media is, you know, there's been a lot around about media and, and, you know, a lot of controversy and such happening surrounding media. I see it myself. These guys are so awesome. They're helping to spread the positive message. But what happens is get written up in Washington Post, New York Times, Runner's World, all these articles came out and guess what? Not a single one of them would mention a plant-based diet. Most of these didn't even mention healthy eating. All they wanted to focus on the miraculous recovery, how crazy the odds were. And yeah, it was crazy odds only in the size of the race that we were in. One out of 40 chance of a single person having a cardiac arrest. Two of them having a cardiac arrest in the same race. It's about one in 1600. Survival during a race is only about 30% survival if you have a cardiac arrest during a race like this. 30% both survived. And what are the odds of a cardiologist being right behind both of them? Absolutely crazy, right? So they focused all on that and they said, oh, everybody should learn CPR, which is great. Yeah, everybody should learn CPR, but isn't it better to prevent the cardiac arrest from happening in the first place? Both of these gentlemen had no symptoms before, no heart disease diagnosis before they admitted to not eating the healthiest diet. Cholesterol numbers may not have been perfect, uh, but they felt great because they were exercising. They were focusing on exercise. One of the mistakes I made was focusing just on exercise. Diet is 80% of health. Exercise is 20%. And so there was one news outlet, the um, Daily Mail. They'd like to be more controversial. So yeah, they talked a lot about um, about uh, healthy eating and plant-based diet and the activism that I've done on my YouTube channel and on my Facebook group. And the, here's a, the, they even included in their article a uh, tweet from our protest in front of the McDonald's headquarters when they were giving out bacon for free. They got a lot of attention. And then, of course, um, one of the favorite things you guys can check out if you like was a podcast interview I did with the exam room podcast through PCRM talking all about this and three foods that your heart loves, which are beans, greens, and berries. Uh, check that one out. But I was so disappointed in how the media really wouldn't focus on the proper message, which is the prevention message. Now, the American Heart Association published articles on it, along with the whole DeMar Hamlin story. And uh, in, our, in my situation, in my articles, they did mention the plant-based diet. It's actually in the guidelines from the American Heart Association. They have to mention it, right? Same with the American Medical Association. They mentioned it, which is great. But the news media, they won't, not at all. That's not what America wants to hear, part of our cultural problems. Mm -hmm.